Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the pre-SAB forum for the October board. Um, just a reminder, we do have our board tomorrow, our board meeting tomorrow um, at the state capitol in room 4202, and it will be starting at 2 p.m. So for our uh, forum today, we're going to have a presentation by the Division of State Architect, the OPSC, and then the California Department of Education. And first up will be the Division of State Architect. Good morning. I'm Masha Lutzuk. I'm representing the um, Structural Codes and Policy Unit at DSA Headquarters. And I'm here to give an update on um, our uh, recent policies, and also at the end of my presentation, I'll provide a um, update on the um, bin time. One second, this page down doesn't work. Oh, this one, okay. All right, I apologize. So um, I really have one main policy topic for today, and I'm gonna spend a few slides discussing this um, as it is a, um, change in our procedures that um, we've developed over the course of the last few months and it's um, regarding local fire authority review which is required at uh, now at the time of application submittal to DSA. This process will be, uh, will go into effect on January 1 of next year and we're providing this update to give folks a courtesy uh, notice. Um, we've issued a bulletin on uh, number 12-02. Uh, this was issued in August also um, to provide a uh, notice to stakeholders. Um, and the other applicable forms here are our, is our form DSA 810. And it has uh, instructions that have been completely revised in anticipation of the new procedures. And we also have a related document uh, which is policy 0901 and it's titled Fire Flow for Buildings. So this, um, I'm now gonna provide a little bit of a background on what is the local fire authority review. How do I get rid of this little thing? One second. All right, so what is the local fire authority re review? This is basically a review of project plans for school buildings by the local fire authority. And usually it's the local fire authority having jurisdiction when the project is occupied. So this would be the entity that, for example, that conducts the annual uh, fire alarm inspections um, prior to school um, year starting. Um, the scope of local fire authority review is to verify that the project meets their requirements that pertain to local firefighting operations. Since DSA has really no knowledge of local fire fighting operation requirements, this um, function may be delegated to the local fire authority. And our bulletin and also um, our form 810 contain the uh, specifications for when this review is required. But in summary, it's uh, one of three situations. Either a project adds building square footage or a project is located in a hazard severity zone area or construction affects any of these things. Elevators, new or changed access roads or gates fire flow or um, new or changed fire water pipe and attachments. Um, so then the, any of these um, items would trigger local fire authority review. So the way that we conduct this review is via form 810 and it must be used to communicate the review. As of now, we allow a um, kind of a free form, the local fire authority review may provide a letter or make markings on the plans, and this is currently accepted. However, as of January 1st, we're going to a standardized template, and we're going to be using our Form 810, which is in use right now. We've modified it, streamlined it, added instructions, and have made it available on optional um, basis, but it has been used by majority of LFAs. But as of January 1st, it will be required at intake. And if during DSA plan review there are changes to the plans and specifications that are made, then the uh, design professional for the school district must go back to the LFA and have them re-review the uh, revised set of plans. So um, this is, I've attempted to paste a little snippet of the form in here just to provide an example. Um, the point I'd like to make is that LFA sign off is specific to each item and for each specific item for example here we have elevators we have actually four options the LFA can either check yes not applicable 
not reviewed or leave it blank. And we have an explanation for each one of these um, uh, terms. So for example, for elevators, we are asking that the local fire authority um, sign off on a particular situation where an elevator does not meet medical emergency service cap size per 2010 CBC. The local fire, fire authority approves the use of stairways for emergency rescue and patient transport. So if the local fire authority can make such determination, yes, the, it does agree, it will mark yes. If all the boxes are left blank, we know that the local fire authority reviewed the item but left it, but left it blank, it couldn't approve it, and then there's a space on the form for comments why it hasn't been approved. Uh, not review is when the local fire authority elects not to review the item. We have been told by those entities that um, we communicate with that sometimes they don't have staffing or time to dedicate to these reviews, and so they delegate their review authority to DSA in which case DSA simply applies minimum code requirements um, to the project. And NA would be for an item that's not applicable to the project. So if elevators are not in the project plans, they're not being added or changed, then the local authority will check NA, but then they must be doing something else on the project where they're involved because they're filling out this form. And to summarize, we are going to be looking for LFA sign-off on this form DSA 810 as of January 1st, 2013. And this way we cut out a chunk of review time in our uh, process because having to do a review on the set of plans that doesn't have LFA sign-off means that we have to then wait for their sign-off and then redo our review. Once their sign-off comes in, it may be altering the plans. So we're, we're cutting the chunk out of this process and um, cutting down our plan review time. So that's the um, summary. And again, in the beginning of the presentation, I cited these documents that need to be reviewed. It's the DSA Bulletin 1202. It's our Form 810 and the instructions and policy 0901. It speaks to the LFA approval process, but it only deals with fire flow for buildings. So it won't touch on elevators, for example, but the process that it describes is similar. And um, this is really the gist of the policy updates for uh, this month. And my next three slides are updates on our bin times. They vary again across the um, state uh, due to our staffing and workload that differs, but you will see, I think, from our probably uh, summer uh, statistics that our bin time is going down in the majority of cases. So for structural, um, in some categories, we have no bin time at all, and in others, it's um, two to four weeks, which is pretty standard as it does t take a bit of time to receive a set of plans do proper intake, et cetera. So it's, it's fairly, um, we consider two weeks to be fairly prompt as far as bin time goes. And for access, again, um, a little bit high in some areas mm -hmm. due to workload specific to that region, but overall, again, about two to five weeks for access. So that sums up my short presentation. Okay. Thank you, Masha. No, no questions? All right, thanks. Okay, so my name is Rick Asbell. I'm with the Office of Public School Construction. We'll get to the next set of slides. Uh, this is our school facility program funds available uh, table. Um, the difference being uh, shown between August and September 2012. So we did have a drawdown. And when you take a look at all the funds of about 207 million point um, six, um, and then the biggest drawdown being for the April 2012 bond sale. When looking at our remaining authority, um, we've got 800.8 800 .8 million as of October 24, 2012, and this is broken out by each one of the programs. Getting to the agenda highlights, there's three that we want to be able to highlight for you. The first one is um, regarding non-participation in the priority funding process. Um, this was actually requested by the board um, in August of 2012. Uh, they wanted us to bring back um, some options when looking at this. And so just to give you a little bit of background, the priority uh, funding process was established in May of 2010. And since that time, we've held five priority funding certification periods. Uh, the, the priority funding process allows districts that are currently on the unfunded list 
the opportunity to submit a fund release to access funding for a project. And for clarification purposes, the term unfunded list, and you'll see in parentheses lack of AB 55 loans, essentially refers to a situation where you have bond authority but you don't have cash to back that bond authority. So just kind of keep that in mind as we're talking about this. And so for each uh, priority funding round, staff compiles a list of applications from districts that have elected to participate in this funding process. Once all of the requests uh, have been received by the participants, the board provides apportionments uh, to projects up to the amount of cash that's available. Now keep in mind, um, as cash comes in, it depends on what um, source they're coming from. It could be 55, 47, Prop 1D, so we have to match up the request to the bond uh, money that's available. Now, there's been a number of projects that have received um, funding through this process. However, there's been uh, quite a few that have elected not to participate in this process also, even though they had eligible applications on the unfunded list. Um, staff right now doesn't really have any specific information as to why this is occurring, why people are bypassing the opportunity to be able to get money. Uh, however, this could be some of the potential issues that districts are, are facing right now. First of all, they could have an issue with trying to get their local match for the share of their project. Um, another issue could be when they're doing the 90-day fund release requirements, um, they have to issue a notice to proceed. Uh, they may not be, have the contracts in place to have 50% of the construction for the project at the time of the 5005, and also documentation showing the project meets all labor compliance uh, program requirements. One of the other issues with the unfunded list is projects can remain on the unfunded list indefinitely, uh, thus reserving bond authority that could be used by other projects. So in considering these issues, staff has come up with three options for the board's considerations. Um, all three options would require some type of regulation change. Uh, the first option would be allow districts to bypass the priority funding process for a finite number of times. Um, whatever the board would decide, whether it's three times, four times, once uh, a district has passed uh, on those many occasions, then the project would be rescinded. Now one of the things that you can look at also with the rescission, always remember um, if it's a uh, career tech project and there's a rescission, that bonding authority goes back to the career tech pot. It doesn't go back to another pot, so kind of keep that in mind also as you're evaluating that option. Option two is to eliminate the priority funding process and fund in order of unfunded approval date. Uh, this option would allow projects to be apportioned in date order down the unfunded list. The priority funding process would be eliminated. As cash becomes available, i.e. through rescissions, bond sales, and so forth, the board um, would provide an apportionment to the first application on the, on the unfunded list and then go down the list as needed. Uh, the board could continue to use the current 90-day time limit on fund release process if they wish to. The third option is implement a time limit for projects on the list of unfunded approvals or the unfunded list. Under this option, the board basically establishes a time frame on how long you can just be on the unfunded list. And once that time has passed, you either come in with a, um, a request for funding or that project would also be rescinded. So in this case, we've thrown out three options and we're seeking board um, direction on this particular item. Are there any questions on this item? Okay. The next item concerns uh, facility hardship funding applications. Um, the board directed the staff to bring back a discussion item after staff informed the board at the September 2012 meeting that several facility hardship projects had been received beyond the available bond authority. The board and its priorities and funding subcommittee have previously discussed whether or not to reserve bond authority for facility hardship projects, but no action was taken by either one of those bodies. As a reminder, the facility hardship program provides funding for the replacement or re rehabilitation of facilities when there is a threat to the health and safety of pupils occupying the facilities. Facility hardships also includes the seismic mitigation program. However, since the seismic mitigation program has separate bond authority available, this item only applies to non-seismic facility hardship projects. So for the current process when placing a project on the unfunded list, once a project has received an unfunded approval within available authority, and that's key, we need to have available authority, it's the board's policy to place all facility hardship replacement and rehabilitation applications at the top of the unfunded list in order of board approval date and then by date received by the OPSC. This gives facility hardship 
projects top priority for apportionments and fund releases if the program receives bond sales and proceeds and the district submits a priority funding certification. Now in the past, the board has taken various actions to provide facility hardship apportionments and to avoid placing facility hardship projects on an unfunded list without bond authority. This occurred in 2003 and also in 2006. So staff is presenting the following proposals for the first proposal, and this is for in-house hardship funding applications. Staff recommends that the board direct staff to fully process the approved applications for facility hardship funding that have been received as of October 24, 2012, which represents $8 million. Once approved by the board, the project are to be placed at the top of the unfunded list per board policy. Proposal number two. Prioritize future facility hardship funding applications for placement on the unfunded list and apportionment. Once bond authority is exhausted, staff recommends that the board give priority to future facility hardship applications beyond the available bond authority. No, existing, uh, no currently existing bond authority would be reserved for future facility hardship applications. However, if bond authority returns to the SFP in the future, i.e. through rescissions or um, future bond sales, Facility hardship applications in-house at that time would be processed to receive approval for placement at the top of the unfunded list and before non-facility hardship projects. The third proposal, continue processing facility hardship conceptual approvals. Conceptual approval is a confirmation of an imminent threat to health and safety but is not a guarantee of funding. After a conceptual approval, a district still needs to obtain the necessary approvals from CDE, DSA, and other state agencies before it can submit a funding request. So staff is recommending that the board um, approve all three of these proposals. Are there any questions on this issue? And then the final item that we wanted to highlight for this board is uh, related to labor compliance requirements as a result of Assembly Bill 1506. Now currently labor code prohibits the release of funds uh, by the SAB until the board has received a written finding that the awarding body has initiated and enforced or contracted with a third party to initiate and enforce a Department of Industrial Relations Labor Compliance Program. The proposed amendments in this particular item provide a process for which schools uh, can submit a written finding if the construction contract was signed prior to the district either contracting with a third party LCP provider or having their LCP approved by the DIR. Now as a reminder, and LCP is required for all projects when they're funded out of Proposition 47 and 55. Projects where the construction contract was awarded after January 1, 2012 are not subject to these requirements. Projects uh, funded from Proposition 1D or Proposition 1A are also not subject to the LCP requirements regardless of the construction contract award date. Now as of a, a result of an appeal that was heard at the September 2012 board, uh, the board asked staff to develop regulations to further cl clarify the LCP requirements. The proposed SFP regulatory amendments would add a new regulation section to clarify the LCP written finding requirement and provide an alternate method for providing the written finding in cases where a district, district initiated and enforced an LCP after the construction contract was signed for the project. All school districts are subject to the LCP requirements would be provided uh, would have to provide a written verification indicating the district or the third party provider submitted an applicable LCP application to the DIR when submitting a form SAB 5005. The written verification would also indicate the district or the third party's LCP is approved by the DIR and has not been revoked. Districts that contracted with a third party LCP or, or obtained a uh, DIR approval of its LCP after the construction contract was signed would be required to submit a report to the OPSC and the DIR from a third party LCP provider that includes the following. Number one, verification that the applicable duties of an LCP were performed on the project. Number two, verification that the performance of the applicable LCP began one month after the commencement of the construction work. Number three, a written record of the LCP's confirmation of monthly payroll records for the project. The report would not be acceptable if the DIR notifies the OPSC within 60 calendar days that it has determined it to be incorrect. The third party provider that completes the report should not be the same third, per, uh, third party 
with whom the district has contracted to implement its LCP program for the project. Now, to allow the DIR 60 calendar days to provide notification that the report is incorrect without conflicting with priority funding deadlines, staff proposes to amend the SFP regulations. The amendment would require applicable districts to submit the third-party LCP report to the OPSC and the DIR at least 60 days prior to submitting a Form 5005. Districts would acknowledge this on its written statement that it indicates it wishes to participate in a priority funding round. To allow districts sufficient time to comply with these new regulations, this requirement would only apply on or after July 1st, 2013. So the recommendation is to approve the regulations and then also authorize the executive officer uh, to file the regulations on an emergency basis with the Office of Administrative Law. Are there any questions? Okay. So next up we have California Department of Education. I can screw it up by myself, I think. Oh, maybe I do. Yeah. Arrow. No, to the right. To the right. Wrong one. Wrong. The other right? Yeah. Oh, those. Yeah, the other right. Um, good afternoon. A uh, couple quick updates today uh, on Green Ribbon, some interesting legislation, uh, some resources that the department has available. Always a good reminder. And uh, uh, go over the opportunities for input on the recently released uh, infrastructure report by uh, UC Berkeley Center for Cities and Schools. So, uh, first of all, the, the second green ribbon uh, uh, process is uh, underway. The application is now on our web page. You can see the link there, and it's due to uh, CDE by December 11th. And there's an archived webinar uh, of a presentation done last week. So you can uh, check out uh, that link also if you want to. Uh, and get a quick overview of things. And the contact there is uh, Kathleen Smothers and her information. Okay. A uh, couple of um, legislative pieces. Uh, Senate Bill 1404 uh, amends the Civic Center Act to allow um, districts to uh, their fees charged to, for community use to cover the cost of capital refurbishment costs, such as. Uh, the wear and tear on your courts and, and field area. This requires the State Board of Education to adopt regulations by January 2013. So that's something we'll be working on over the, uh, over the year. Kathleen Smothers is also taking the lead on that one. Assembly Bill 1199, uh, Proposition um, 39 Oversight Committees uh, originally could serve two two-year terms. Uh, the State Board of Education was, has been presented with uh, several waiver requests to create a uh, third term for, for members. Uh, so this bill will uh, now change the, uh, add a second uh, third year term uh, for oversight committees. Uh, next is AB 2367, which expands the authority of schools to sell produce from school gardens. Now, there's already some existing uh, language that uh, you can sell produce from school gardens, but and this uh, uh, expands that authority. You can read about it in the detail. But one of the key points is that the school must comply with all the applicable federal, state, and local health safety standards regarding food handling, food processing, and growing. So uh, check that out. Uh, AB 1915 expands the Safe Routes to School program. There's a federal program and, and, and the state program. Uh, and this allows a, a school district to collaborate with a city or county. Uh, school districts can't apply by themselves to use the funds for safe routes to schools. And so that you have a route uh, that would get you to a bus stop, so something away from the school site. And despite intense lobbying by Mick Jagger, there were no shelters included in that, merely paths. For you younger folks, I'll explain that later. <laughs> um, resources, uh, always a good reminder to uh, let you know what we do have on our webpage as uh, uh, for new school planning, reconfiguring existing schools, doing your needs assessment on existing schools, kind of looking at uh, 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 you know what is uh, 
the school, if I add 20 classrooms with the kids, what things do I need to consider? So uh, you know, our school site and approval guide talks about the process uh, of uh, identifying hazards around school sites. Uh, guide to school site analysis development is the aid region, the layout. Uh, the physical education planning guides and the small school site planning guides offer a good structure for looking at the adequacy of, uh, of the site, uh, taking into account multi-story and providing for um, the requirements for physical education. Okay. Our school closure best practice. And healthy and supportive school environments offers a number of uh, links and information on indoor air quality, uh, thermal comfort, so something to take a look at there. Healthy children ready to learn is another best practice document talking about nutrition and uh, physical education. And of course the power lines and pipelines, uh, things to look at if you have those near your existing schools, uh, some possible mitigation way, uh, uh, measures that you might want to consider. We've also had on our web page for the past year or so uh, four two-page documents that capsulize research on, in these four areas on the impact of uh, quality school facilities on learning, uh, safe schools, sustainable schools, and schools as the centers of community. Uh, and these are, are been getting more and more uh, phone calls from parents and others in districts that are using these. Uh, and working with their communities on either uh, needs assessments or in working with their school board on on the conditions of schools and so take a look at that uh, they are summaries but they do provide a complete bibliography if you want to delve into the details let's see and some of our upcoming work um, on best practice will include daylighting and student-centered learning environments so another activity for 2013 and you can get us some comments on, on uh, those uh, uh, as we go along if you have some examples or uh, uh, some research on that. And I think yes. other activities in the department are uh, uh, a list of the superintendent's initiatives. Uh, that, remember the schools of the future we did last year uh, was one of the first ones out soon after he took office in uh, uh, January 2011. Uh, last month was the Educator Excellence Task Force, uh, Education Technology Task Force in August. Uh, next month is Creative Education, which is art. STEM in early 2013, that's Science, Technology, Engineering, and Math. And then Environmental Education Task Force. So there's the web link if you want more information on those or uh, want to contact some of the, the folks that are still working on those. And then the California K through 12 infrastructure report that Dr. Vincent Center for City Schools prepared uh, uh, was released a couple months ago and we've had several opportunities to receive uh, public input starting back in August with our advisory committee, the county school facility group. Uh, uh, October 1st we had an invite only discussion of 80 some stakeholders. We presented a uh, at last week at the fall conference of cash and was uh, the focus of uh, much of the discussion down there and then our next will be on November 13th so in a couple weeks we will be having uh, a video conference available at these county offices of education and there's more we're adding uh, as we go along so check out our what's new page for details it will give you the login information and if you can't make it to the county office, there's also the ability to connect via your computer uh, using uh, WebEx, I believe. Okay. And I think that's it. Unless I want to talk. Is that Bill? No, we're here. Well, good afternoon. My name is Brigida Ball, and I'm the supervisor for the Overcrowding Relief Program. And I'm going to give you a few updates that have occurred recently regarding the program. So on September the 19th of this year, the State Allocation Board approved two additional cycles for the ORG program. It'll be the 11th and the 12th cycle. 
And then currently we're processing the 10th cycle, um, which we have 23 applications. Um, and the ending date for the 10th cycle was July 31st of this year. We have approximately $113 million that's being requested for the 10th cycle, and we're processing 252 portables within those projects to replace, uh, by, to replace with permanent um, classrooms. We have a balance of $103 million um, that's remaining for the, the 11th and 12th cycle. And then the applications for the 11th cycle starts August the 1st of this year, and then will continue to January 31st of 2013. If the funds are exhausted in the um, 11th cycle, there will not be a 12th cycle. And if there is a 12th cycle, that will begin February 1st of 2013 and will close uh, July 31st of next year, 2013. So these are things that I've talked about before, but just little reminders about the program. Um, just, just some beware things to make sure that we process your application in the fastest way. Please ensure that you're 5004, um, the number of classrooms in line 2I and 3 match, um, and make sure that Department of Education, um, if the, the letter should be reflecting ORG, and if there's any changes to your, your actual project, please make sure that you go back through CDE to update your CDE letter. If you're submitting hybrid projects such as new construction and mod projects with the uh, overcrowding relief um, project, please make sure that your cover letter indicates that because if you're not um, sending in your new construction and your mod at the same time as your ORG project, um, it's nice to have that cover letter so we can search for it just in case they get separated or if they're submitted separately. Also, make sure that you delineate whether the portables will be demolished or relocated. I talk about this all the time because um, it makes things easier when we're processing application and um, we know that removal can mean different things and in, in our view when we're reviewing the applications, um, use the word demolition, uh, demolish if you're you know, going to demolish a project. If you're relocating, uh, we look at that as you know, transport. So, you know, just make sure when you use removal, make sure that you give us a more defined answer as what you mean by removal because it is a universal term. If you're using ORG sites, um, other ORG sites, please provide an update site map and that helps us kind of orient ourselves as to the numbers of sites that are being um, replaced with portables, um, permanent classrooms, excuse me. Make sure you have enough portables on the site you're using to be in compliance with the ORG school facilities regulations. And the clearer, like I said, the clearer the application is, the faster we'll be able to process. If you have any questions at all, we are available. Um, please also check out, our, check out the CDE website, which is indicated on the um, screen. Um, and then again, you can contact me at any time. Um, my number is also on the screen. And Alan Schumacher, Schumacher, excuse me, who is the project manager who is processing all the applications at this time. Any questions? Okay. Well, thank you very much. Good afternoon. I'm Valerie Castro. I'm an analyst with the OPSC Legislation and Implementation Team. And with me is Nate Gargiulo, an analyst with the OPSC Communications Team. Today we're going to present information about the impact of the proposed regulatory changes about handling new construction and modernization applications for funding that are received after bond authority for those programs has been exhausted. Some of the things we're going to cover include some definitions. We do have a couple of new definitions that were included in the proposed regulations. We are going to go over the proposed regulatory changes and the new process that we'll be following for applications received under that new regulation. We're going to talk about how we're going to handle eligibility documents and financial hardship approvals. 
We're also going to go over a new web page that was launched just a little while ago today for applications received beyond bond authority, as well as a few tips that we have. At the September meeting, the State Allocation Board approved the creation of a new regulation section that impacts how the OPSC will process applications received when there is no existing bond authority to fund them. There are a couple of reasons for the new regulation section. First, the State Allocation Board raised a concern that placing the projects on a true unfunded list could imply a commitment on the part of the state. Second, we don't know at this time what a future school facilities bond might look like, and applications that are submitted under the current program may be incompatible with eligibility and funding criteria under a future program. We've included a few acronyms here. I think everyone probably is familiar with these, but they're available in the PowerPoint. So some of the definitions that we want to cover include some current ones, but I think they're useful to review. Approved application. This means a district has submitted the application to the OPSC with all of the required documents. The required documents are listed in the general information sections of the forms SAB 5001, 5002, 5003, and 5004. A few examples of required documents are the CDE and DSA approval letters, cost estimates, plans and specifications. Ready for apportionment. This means that OPSC has completed its analysis and determined that the application meets all the requirements of law for approval by the board. <clears throat> the unfunded list lack of AB 55 loans is a list of applications for which the SAB has bond authority but not sufficient cash. These applications have been fully processed by the OPSC and approved by the board and are waiting for cash to become available through bond sales and rescissions. The projects remain on the list until an apportionment can be made through the priority funding process. Now, these are some new terms. I'm going to read these verbatim. Bond authority means the authority of the State Allocation Board to apportion bond funds pursuant to Education Code Section 17070.40. Insufficient bond authority means the total funding requested on the approved application received by the OPSC exceeds the bond authority. And another new rep, um, regulation, another new definition in our regulations, applications received beyond bond authority means an informational list of applications submitted to the OPSC and presented to the board. Funding applications on this list contain the preliminary grant amounts requested by the district. The OPSC has not determined that the approved applications are ready for apportionment. Before we take a look at the proposed changes, I want to review the current process. This process will remain in place for projects requesting funding for which there is sufficient bond authority, such as the seismic mitigation program. For eligibility determinations, districts submit their application. The OPSC processes the eligibility application for SAB approval. For funding applications, districts submit their funding application, including all of the required documents. OPSC process the applications for SAB approval. Those go on an unfunded approval list, and they, the districts are eligible to submit a certification during the filing rounds for priority funding, and then they wait until funding is released and they can be eligible to receive an apportionment at that time. Then the fiscal process is that the OPSC releases grant amounts after they certify that the district has its matching share and that the construction contract has been entered. After construction has begun, 
The district submits expenditure reports to the OPSC and OPSC finally performs an expenditure review. And now to look at how the process will change for projects that request funding for which there is insufficient bond authority, such as new construction and modernization. Applications for funding for programs with no remaining bond authority would be placed on the new informational list that's officially entitled Applications Received Beyond Bond Authority List and is also commonly referred to as the Acknowledged List. Applications placed on this list would not be processed by the OPSC beyond an intake review, nor would they appro be approved by the board, but the list would be presented to the board for acknowledgement. In addition, the proposed regulations would require districts to include a school board resolution with their application for funding. Applications received after the regulations go into effect that do not include this resolution would be considered incomplete and could be returned to the district. There are five statements that must be included on the school board resolution. If the application requests financial hardship funding, there is a sixth statement that must be included. These statements are listed in the proposed regulation section 1859.95.1b. The OPSC has already received enough applications to exhaust bond authority for new construction and modernization funding. As a result, the proposed emergency regulations would take effect immediately upon approval by the Office of Administrative Law. The proposed regulations are available on the OPSC website. If you go to our home page and click on the resources tab, there's a, a link for regulations and underneath school facilities program, the last link is proposed regulations. Now for the new process. The proposed regulations would only affect funding applications for new construction and modernization programs. Applications received for other programs would continue under the current process. Some programs such as the overcrowding relief grant have their own application processes such as funding cycles. Until the Office of Administrative Law approves the proposed regulations, new construction and modernization applications are being processed to a true unfunded list pursuant to SFP regulation section 1859.95. New construction and modernization applications received on or after the date the OAL approves the proposed regulations would fall under the new process. OPSC would verify that all required documents are included with the application, then place the application on an acknowledged list. Before we new, move to the next part of my presentation, we want to remind districts about prevailing wage monitoring. Current statute, Labor Code Section 1771.3, mandates compliance with prevailing wage monitoring and enforcement requirements for any project funded from state bond funds, which have initial construction contracts awarded on or after January 1st of 2012. What this means is that districts must comply with those rules to be eligible to receive school facility program funding or state funding under a possible future facilities bond. You can comply with this three different ways. There's the Department of Industrial Relations approved in-house programs, an appropriate collective bargaining agreement or project labor agreement, and finally, the Department of Industrial Relations Compliance Monitoring Unit. The proposed regulations would also impact how OPSC will handle eligibility determination documents. We would not be fully processing these either. However, we want to remind districts that if they are submitting a new construction funding application, they must submit eligibility documents 
prior to or concurrent with that application. This is because of the existing regulation section 1859.70. If bond authority should become available, we would be unable to process a new construction application if it, the eligibility had not been updated. Districts are not required to submit an eligibility determination for modernization under the proposed regulations. However, if they do, the same process will be followed. They will be reviewed to verify that all required documents are included and then placed on the acknowledged list without further analysis. We have some side-by-side -side charts here to compare the current process with the new process under proposed regulation 1859.95.1. For eligibility, under the current process, the OPSC fully processes the application and it's presented to the board for approval. Under the proposed regulation, OPSC would simply verify that all required documents were enclosed with the eligibility application and add it to a list for acknowledgement. Next, funding applications. Under the current process, the OPSC fully processes the application and it's presented to the SAB for approval. Currently, these are unfunded approvals due to the lack of AB 55 loans. The project remains on the list and the district may participate in a certification filing for priority funding to be eligible to receive an apportionment when cash becomes available. Under the proposed regulation, the OPSC would simply verify that all required documents were enclosed with the funding app and add it to a list for SAB acknowledgement. And finally, fiscal services. Under the current process, the OPSC releases funds upon certification of the district matching funds and the construction contract. After construction begins, the district submits expenditure reports to the OPSC. And finally, OPSC would perform an expenditure review. Under the proposed regulation, none of this would apply because the application would not be processed. There are also some changes to how financial hardship reviews will be conducted. In addition to suspending the full reviews for eligibility and funding applications, the proposed regulations would also suspend the financial hardship pre-approval reviews. Under current regulation section 1859.81, Districts requesting financial hardship funding are required to be pre-approved by the OPSC and then they include a copy of their pre-approval letter with their funding application. Under the proposed regulation, a financial hardship district would submit its funding application without going through the pre-approval process. Instead of a pre-approval letter, the district would include an additional acknowledgement on its school board resolution to recognize that financial hardship approval would be required before the application could be processed to the board for approval. And again, a side-by-side -side chart to show the differences. Under the current process, the district must have pre-approval the application package must include a copy of the pre-approval letter. The application goes through the full review and approval process to the unfunded lack of AB 55 loans list. The district may participate in the certification filing for priority funding and if cash becomes available and the application has been on the lack of AB 55 loans list for more than 180 days, a financial hardship re-review is required before funds can be released. Under the proposed regulations, no financial hardship pre-approval is required. Instead of a pre-approval letter, the district would add an acknowledgement about financial hardship to its school board resolution. The OPSC would only verify the required documents and put the application on a list for SAB acknowledgement. If authority becomes available, the district must undergo a financial hardship review and approval before its application could be processed to the board. 
And this is a timeline. I know this is difficult to see. In addition to the PowerPoint presentation, this chart as a standalone document is being posted to our new web page. So you'll be able to look at that a little more closely. What we've put together here is a timeline that shows the three different lists that we're going to have and the dates, the OPSC receive dates for the applications which would determine which list those applications would go on. So the first column is the unfunded list, lack of AB 55 loans. The column in the middle is the true unfunded list and the far right column is the applications received beyond bond authority list or the so-called acknowledged list. So for new construction, applications that are received between April 20th and July 12th of this year would go to the unfunded list, lack of AB 55 loans. Applications received between July 13th and the OAL approval of the proposed regulations would go to the true unfunded list. And then applications that are received on or after the date of the OAL approval would go to the acknowledged list. I want to point out that the dates are a little bit fluid because some of these projects are not, they haven't been completely processed yet. And as districts know, as the project managers are going through the applications, some of the grant amounts could change. If that happens, it could impact either direction this July 12th date. For modernization, the applications received between April 20th and May the 9th would go to the lack of AB 55 loans list. Applications received between May 10th and OAL approval would go to the true unfunded list. And then applications received on or after the date of OAL approval would go to the acknowledged list. And then there are some brief summaries of what that means but we've gone over that in the presentation. But this is a nice standalone document. And if there are any changes to these dates, such as when we get an approval from the Office of Administrative Law, we will update that with the dates. If there are any changes to the dates of the applications that are going on the, the lack of AB 55 loans list, we will change those dates as well. As I mentioned, the chart is going on our new website, and so Nate is going to tell you about that and other resources. Thank you, Valerie. Um, as Valerie mentioned, um, my name is Nate Gargiulo, and I'm from the communications team, and I'm here today to talk to you about the new web page that is devoted to this new process that OPSC is undertaking. And this OPSC website is going to include, as Valerie mentioned, the timeline showing which list and application for funding will be placed on depending on OPSC receive date. It's going to have a sample school board resolution, frequently asked questions, and an outreach plan. Um, really like a one-stop shop for all the information and resources you need for this new process. Um, other contents that are also going to be included are links to proposed regulation 1859.95.1 the application lists, and the OPSC project manager county assignments. There's also going to be um, background of the issue and decision making, so links to the SAB and implementation meeting agendas, webcasts, and SAB transcripts, all on the same web page, easy to find and use for your own resources. Helpful hints. Um, what we want to talk about here is districts preparing to submit an application may contact their OPSC project manager to inquire if bond authority exists to determine whether or not a school board resolution is required or to determine whether or not a financial hardship pre-approval is required. Districts that are uncertain if their applications will be received before or after OAL approval may choose to obtain a school board resolution before the regulations are approved. Districts are encouraged to submit plan specifications and other large required documents in electronic format on CDs or memory sticks. Districts should ensure the application is complete upon submittal. The OPSC will continue to track date order received for all approved applications. 
the OPSC will continue to provide only a 24-hour courtesy notice to school districts that are missing required documentation. Current statute requires compliance with prevailing wage monitoring and enforcement requirements for any project funded from state bond funds which have initial construction contracts awarded on or after January 1, 2012, Labor Code Section 1771.3. This means that districts need to comply to be eligible for school facility program funding for even a new state facility program. We really want to stress that as Valerie mentioned as well earlier. That is all we have unless there's any questions. I believe they were filed yesterday and they are posted on our our regulations section on our website. They are emergency regulations. Mm -hmm. And one quick thing I, I forgot to mention with the new webpage is actually just right under our quick links section of our webpage. So if you go onto OPC homepage under quick links, applications received beyond bond authority. You click on there, it takes you to all the content, all the proposed regulations, webcasts, transcripts, um, PM county assignments, it's all there on one page. And I, I also want to mention on the state allocation board meetings and the implement, implementation committee meetings, all of those documents reference the page number that the item begins on and the webcast of the board meetings includes the start and end times in those webcasts. So you don't have to watch an hour of the board meeting before it gets to that discussion. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Steve Inman, a supervisor in the Financial Hardship Unit, and I'm here today with John Leininger, one of our auditors, to discuss the Financial Hardship Unfunded Re-Review process. And uh, if we go back a year, just about a year ago today, back to October 2011, Jason Hernandez, who's um, also a Financial Hardship Supervisor in our Specials Unit, uh, we conducted a webinar on the same subject matter we're going to talk about today. So much of what we're talking about today is in that webinar, and you can access that on the OPSC Internet under Resources, Presentations, uh, Financial Hardship uh, Webinar Presentation. Our key objective here today is to reemphasize some of the key parts of the Financial Hardship Unfunded Re-Review process and um, go over some new forms we've added to our OPSC Internet website. Okay. Back here. Some of the topics we're going to talk about today are um, some background over the unfunded re-review process, submitting your documents for an unfunded re-review, um, our actual review of the available funds, and finally, the financial hardship uh, re-review findings letter. One thing I want to point out is um, on May 25, 2011, a little bit of background, uh, the State Allocation Board um, allowed SFP Regulation 1859.81 to sunset. And what that regulation originally did is allow um, for not allow re-reviews for districts um, um, who lack funding from um, uh, lack of AB 55 loans, okay, which have been discussed earlier today. Okay. What does this mean for school districts with financial hardship projects on the unfunded list? Okay, this means that unfunded approvals that occurred between February 25, 2009 and June 30, 2011 uh, require a review of financial information only after June 30, 2011. That means the OPSC will only review financial information availability of funds after that date. For any unfunded approval that occurred after June 30, 2011, um, the funds are open for review. But at, we go back, we have two choices going back three years or back to the most current review.
Priority funding round participation. Okay. What triggers a process? Well, the priority funding round participation triggers a process. That is, financial hardship districts that are, have unfunded approvals and um, choose to certify in the most current priority and funding round um, are, are eligible to um, uh, undergo a financial hardship re-review. Uh, apl applicable districts are sent a notification letter and the appropriate unfunded review financial hardship checklist. And the districts have 15 calendar days to submit the requested inf documentation. Districts should submit the required information as soon as possible. The reason is um, timelines are short. Uh, when money is available at a certain time, we want to make sure we can get all the financial hardship districts that um, certify and um, potentially available for funding process before the next available board. Uh, a major part of this process, the district does not have to reestablish its financial hardship status. That was done during the prior full review. This review is just a review of the available funds since the prior review. District contracts. One thing we want to emphasize is that it's very important to have a reliable day-to-day -day contact, um, preferably an accounting person or somebody familiar with the application package um, who can help resolve issues and provide information as we process the application. Uh, the contact should include uh, district accounting staff familiar with the facility accounting, general ledgers, financial hardship re-review package. Oftentimes we have a lot of questions about the general ledger. Just um, um, translating some of the information in there. Um, and again, it's important to uh, receive timely answers to questions. Sometimes we have to wait a day or two or a week or, um, for answers to questions. And in the financial hardship unfunded re-review process, time is of the essence. So we need answers as soon as we can get those answers. Okay. My name so is with that, I'm going to turn it over to John Leininger, one of our auditors. Okay, my name is John Leininger. I'm currently an auditor on the Financial Hardship Review Team. And the Financial Hardship Unfunded Review begins with the submittal of a complete package. This package would include a cover letter stating the district is submitting documents for a financial hardship review. It would also have a completed and signed appropriate unfunded review financial hardship checklist that can be found on the link. And I want to reemphasize something that Steve pointed out. What's new this time is before there was only one checklist for an unfunded review. Now there are two depending on which group you fall in and we'll talk about that some more as we go further in the presentation. Then we also look for the appropriate backup documents. Once an, a financial hardship unfunded re-review package is received by OPSE, we review it for completeness. If there's some missing documentation, we will set it aside, contact the district, and leave it set aside until we receive the required information and we'll move to a complete package for processing. If you want to find the financial hardship forms, uh, you can open to the OPSC homepage at the link identified here. In the upper left, you can click on a Forms tab on the upper left side of the screen. You then would click on the Forms by Program tab that's in the middle of the page of the next screen. The following screen, you would click where it says Financial Hardship Program Forms. It's about the tenth item down on the list. From there, you click on, there's a plus sign on a blue box marked Financial Hardship Program Eligibility Forms. This will drop down a list of forms needed for financial hardship. And the unfunded review financial hardship checklist is the third form listed. Again, at this point, you'll see something new because you have to select either the form that's titled for unfunded approval dates between February 25th, 2009 and June 30th, 2011, or for unfunded approval dates after June 30th, 2011. So you have to know the approval date of when you went on the unfunded list, so you select the right checklist, whichever is appropriate. 
What we do once we have a complete package is we review the district's financial information to make a determination if there are any additional available funds since the last review or if there's been any additional expenditures, uh, contribution due to expenditures. Again, we want to emphasize the review will not start until the documentation is complete. If we don't have full documentation, we'll set it aside until we get the full documentation and in the meantime move to the next completed package to get it done. During the review, what we're primarily looking for is possible funding sources of received monies since July 1st of 2011 if you're in the group, I call it group one, where you had your approval between uh, July 25th, 2009 and June 30th, 2011. Or what we'll do is go back to the last prior review. And again, that could be uh, some length of time up to as much as three years, but primarily it's going to go back to the last review because we're looking for uh, any additional funds. We look primarily for certificates of participation, general obligation bonds, redevelopment funds, developer fees. Uh, again, there may be some sale of surplus property and Obviously, this is just a typical list. It's not exhaustive, but we are looking for additional funds available. Once we make a determination of the available funds using the information provided by the district, we will issue a financial hardship re-review findings letter that's sent to the district with the attached fund worksheets to show how we arrived at the available, new available funds or additional amounts. The district has 15 days to respond to this letter uh, and that's done so by signing off on the letter and signing off the attached uh, fund worksheets that we've sent and returning them. If the district doesn't agree with the findings, they may contact us and submit additional documents during this time period, which we would then again review the additional information. It may or may not make a change in our findings. We would send back an updated or revised findings letter. But eventually, we have received a signed worksheets and uh, the uh, findings letter from the district once they've concurred. At that point, after the dist district's concurred, an unfunded approval letter will be issued and the district may receive an apportionment if funds are available. And again, up to this point, we've done all of the work, but we still can't have an apportionment until there's funds available. Some frequently asked questions that have come up uh, over the past few times that we've done this are, I just received a financial hardship approval letter less than six months ago. However, I just received your contact letter for an unfunded review. Do I need one? The answer is you might. It depends on the SAB date. For example, if you went on the unfunded list in May, it's now November, we're doing reviews, you're still within the six months or the 180 days. But by the time it's processed and it goes to the board, we've now exceeded 180 days, so you would need to do a re-review. Another question was, will extensions of the deadline be granted in order to compile needed documents? And again, uh, certainly we're going to grant extensions if you need the time to get the work, but the district needs to recognize that only a complete package is processed. If there are delays in providing needed documents, we process them in the order that we've received complete packages so it may move the district a little bit further down the workload list and it may jeopardize their ability to receive an apportionment. Another question was, what if the district does not have any capital outlay funds? In this particular case, you would mark no for the question in section one on the checklist. You would then indicate why a fund worksheet is not submitted in section two and then just simply provide either audited financial statements and or some general ledger detail reports to confirm that you have no funds available in that particular fund. The last question is, since this is a re-review, will awards be adjusted upward for cost increases in materials, labor, or et cetera, like a COLA? It might, but it's independent of the re-review. 
the re review is only to determine if the district can contribute additional funds to the projects on the unfunded list or they've had additional contribution due to expenditure expenditure the review does not increase or decrease the overall approved project cost again independent of the review the overall approved project cost may be increased or decreased and adjusted but it has nothing to do with the re review so a brief overview of what we've gone over we've talked a little bit briefly about the district has a financial hardship project on the unfunded list requests to have the financial hardship project compete in the current priority and funding round we contact the district to request documents needed for the financial hardship review and again what's new this time there are now two groups so there's two different checklists the district submits the needed documents for re-review we do an available funds review findings letter is sent to the district once we receive the signed findings letter and the fund worksheet signed then we can issue a ready for apportionment letter if you do have any questions some contact information uh, again the supervisors are Steve Inman Jason Hernandez and the staff currently assigned are Maria Gamino myself John Leininger Audrey Sims Davis or Jackie Shepard and we've got their phone numbers and their emails for you to contact them any questions Okay, I think I'm the wrap-up, right? Excellent. So, uh, Bill Savage from the State Allocation Board, Assistant Executive Officer, going to give you a little update on the Implementation Committee of the State Allocation Board meeting of October 12th. Uh, the Implementation Committee stakeholder group met to review adding modernization projects to the Project Information Worksheet, and this was the fourth time uh, that we had looked at this item. And at this meeting, OPFC brought a streamlined proposal with uh, two key elements uh, contained in it. First, costs to be provided on a site-wide or project-wide basis for the type of work completed and no detailed building information required. The uh, staff presented this as a mock-up uh, of the PIW, which is on the next page. And uh, the, this, is, this would be similar to the project uh, information section that is required for new construction uh, now on the PIW where districts would enter in this case the type of work uh, for the project building replacement site work structural safety etc and the and a rough order of magnitude uh, cost for the hard construction uh, of the project in addition districts would uh, indicate classrooms or uh, facilities that would be that were modernized uh, under the project and finally uh, uh, the proposal here is that districts would also uh, update and include a uh, square footage calculation of the uh, modernization project so that we could calculate the total modernization cost per square foot uh, of the project so we got uh, we had a lively discussion as we always do at the implementation committee and uh, we did get input from the committee that they thought that this approach was really the best one that had pres been presented yet. <clears throat> there were still some concerns from the committee regarding the accuracy of the cost data uh, because of the difficulties of essentially extracting the data from the schedule of values on a construction project. There were requests from the committee to do a pilot project and there were still concerns from the committee about providing square footage data uh, for the plans. So we'll be reviewing this uh, one more time and hopefully having a final look before we take it to the board. Our next implementation committee meeting is on November 8th, 2012. And as our last item today, I'm going to give you a brief update on the most recent audit working group of the audit subcommittee of the State Allocation Board. The audit working group met on October 9th, 2012 here in Sacramento. And we were following up on a meeting of the audit subcommittee on the 27th of August <clears throat> where we presented uh, the proposed process for SFP review and audits that included uh, a process for external audits to be performed uh, by school districts that receive SFP funds. 
And the audit subcommittee the, uh, uh, requested, in fact, uh, the chair asked uh, us to go back with the audit working group and wrestle with this project and this process a little more and look at including Proposition 39 audits as the external audits for school facilities program projects. And so what, this is the uh, process, and I know you can read all of the boxes on here, but you'll be able to see it on your screen, at, hopefully at, on your home computer or work computer. But part of what we're talking about here is the external audit function that's indicated on this flow chart and the proposed uh, external audit function that we had been reviewing with the audit working group ha was proposed to be performed as part of the district's annual fiscal audit or education audit. And what the subcommittee asked us to do was go back and look at whether or not districts could do this as part of their Proposition 39 audits, an audit that they're already performing at the local level for facilities projects. What we did is assemble an expert panel on Prop 39. Uh, the four members of the panel are listed on your screen. They provided uh, an overall uh, review of Prop 39 audits. Uh, including statutory and legal framework. We had uh, a representative from the California League of Bond Oversight Committees to provide an oversight committee perspective. We had a school district to provide a review of uh, how districts are audited and Prop 39 audits. And we had a private accounting firm that performs performance audits for Prop 39 uh, districts to provide perspective on what would work and what wouldn't work as part of that process. So what did we hear? Uh, we heard a, a lot of great background information. We heard that this process could work, uh, probably has uh, some additional uh, changes in law and regulation, potentially more than would be required when using the education audit process. The working group itself was split on whether this approach was workable or the best path. And one of the best uh, items to come out of the discussion was whether uh, it wouldn't be important to offer a choice to districts and to county offices that you could use either approach so that the audit guide that OPSC would develop uh, for SFP projects could be applied to the Education Audit Appeals Panel, could be applied to Prop 39 audits, and going forward the districts would have a choice for <coughs> implementing that strategy. Uh, next steps, clearly uh, we're going to be working with OPSC staff, and they're hard at work right now, I'm sure. Um, Mr. Asbell's right behind me, in fact, obviously he's not, not working right now. <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> next steps would be to develop uh, an implementation matrix for Prop 39 audits. Uh, also looking closely at uh, developing our audit guide uh, internally and uh, updating our working group recommendations to bring back to the audit subcommittee. Our next meeting is scheduled for, of the audit working group is scheduled for Monday, December 3rd at 10 a.m. and we anticipate reviewing updated recommendations at that time. And that's my report. Are you gonna take over, Rick? Yeah, we got, okay. we got one uh, point of clarification. Earlier in uh, Valerie Castro's presentation okay. regarding um, the regulations associated with applications received beyond bond authority list, uh, we had said that the uh, regulations were over at OAL, and that's not correct. We just confirmed that uh, we're probably looking at probably next week before those get sent over. So I just want to make that point of clarification. So I think this okay. wraps up the, the forum. Uh, thank you for listening in and, and watching. And uh, as a reminder, uh, the meeting is scheduled for 2 p.m. tomorrow in room 4202 in the Capitol. Hope to see you there. Thank you.